Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kreit and I'm the host for today's talk. So today's speaker is Lutz Martin. Lutz is a professor of general and African linguistics at the SOAS University of London, and he is the head of the SOAS doctoral school. His research interests are in formal linguistic and linguistic theory, comparative and historical linguistics, language variation and change, and questions of language, society, and identity. Most of his work focuses on African languages of Eastern and Southern Africa, and particularly Bantu languages such as Swahili, Bemba, and Herero. And he has recently completed a three-year funded project uh, titled Morphosyntactic Variation in Bantu, Typology, Context, and Change. He is currently working with Clara Momani and Yimi Kihara on a British Academy funded project on the description of Kenyan Bantu language Kitabeta. And he's involved in the British Academy writing workshop on eroding dichotomies, description, analysis, and publishing in African linguistics. Uh, please join me in welcoming Lutz as he gives his talk, Kitaveta Language Research Between Community Documentation and Linguistic Ecology. Uh, brilliant. Uh, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really nice to be, and it's nice to see a lot of um, friends in the audience. This is really, really good. Um, I, you know, I've been following the, you know, the network for quite some time, but I, I've been to some events, but um, but I, you know, I would have liked to en engage more. Um, like Anna said, I'm the head of a doctoral school at the moment. That takes quite a bit of time from research to mainly firefighting. But um, um, I'm glad to be here. So this is it's a very initial outline of work we've been doing um, in southern Kenya on Taveta for the last nominally for the last couple of years, but realistically only for the last year because of of COVID. Um, so I wanted wanted to present here a little bit the context of the uh, of the project, um, initial findings where we're going, and and you know maybe future plans as well. So the title is slightly granted. It's Kitaweta language research between community documentation and linguistic ecology. And you can you know see maybe and, and we can in the question time go back to that um, where where I'm going with that. Um, I should also add that this is um, joint work <clears throat> with a number of people that I have um, um, images later on I introduce. Uh, people, but I think Hannah actually is in the audience, so um, she has been involved in that quite centrally. Um, and then the two Kenyan co um, uh, co investigators are Clara Momani and Jimmy Kehara. Um, and then we have a bunch of um, language consultants, Wazes, um, Ruth Leklangis, uh, Nimro Kitosh, um, Rafael Misula, and Kodowana Shera, and Tom Yelpke. He is a PhD student who joined us at one of the visits um, as well um, um, earlier um, this year. Well, last year now. Um, good. Um, a bit of background. So the Taveta or Taveta um, is a community language of about 20,000 speakers. Again, numbers um, are not, not easy to come by. Um, spoken in Taita Taveta County in southern Kenya. Um, the area is characterized by a high degree of multilingualism and culture diversity. Um, and of course, as you would expect, that part of the world, the use of Swahili, but also English um, is widespread and younger speakers are often are perceived as being less fluent in Tabeta than the older generation. I think that's true. I think the brackets are, are justified. Uh, but there is an interesting discourse in the community about, about intergeneration transfer and language competence and, and use. Um, there is very little linguistic work on the language um, um, existing at the moment. Um, and what I want to do here is to present initial findings from, from the current project, uh, which was officially launched in, in 2019. Um, so I want to give a bit of an overview of the project um, and then <clears throat> have a, a brief dip into language ideologies and attitudes. And there's much more work, but, you know, which can be done, needs to be done. But just to give an idea. And then I have some early results or topics where we looked a little bit at the expression of emotion, of lexical, lexicoding of gender relations and loan words and loan translations. Um, then I have a brief session on where we are, where we are with the uh, planned outputs and then challenges of, and future work. Um, please, if you um, if you want to interrupt, please please do. Um, I probably can't see hands easily, but but just just speak up if you have questions. Um, and there's time at the end of this as well. And one thing I was you know I was I was hoping to get out of it is a little bit also to contextualize this work and work you guys are doing and which are going on in the area, and maybe maybe think about how we you know join forces. Um, you will see at the last slide, but I can tell you now that the funding we had for this project, the current funding, has run out at the end of last month, so two days ago. Um, and though we are, we are a little bit in the stage also of rethinking where we want to, where, where we want to go in the future. Um, <clears throat> so this is the background. It's uh, Taveta, the, the place is called Taveta. It's a town 
in Tata Rebeta country. Um, it's close to the Kenyan Tanzanian border. I have, I have um, maps just now. Uh, the town is named after the main ethnic group in the area, the Wataveta, um, who's speaking Taveta, Ki Taveta. Um, and that's the Swahili version of the Taveta version, Ki Taveta. Um, and that, and again, it's an interesting discussion we had with the community and with the, with the consultants we work um, in terms of whether you know, the appropriate use for, let's say, international publications is the, the Englishized, Anglicized Taveta, the Swahiliized Ki Taveta or Ki Taveta. And I think there is a little bit of tendency towards using Kita Veta in these wider inter international contexts. Um, and the area has long been home to a complex situation of multilingual, multi multicultural com complexity. Um, so here are a, a few maps, um, which I, you know, I'm, I mean, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're happy with the top um, left one. Um, what is maybe more interesting, if you zoom in. Um, the geography is interesting because it's one, the, the colonial borders are the straight line and there's lots of discussion about why Mount Kilimanjaro is on the Tanzanian side rather than on the Kenyan side in, in terms of you know, German English colonial history. But the other oddity of the border maybe is if you look at the uh, top right hand side map that other than, you know, so the, the line essentially runs straight from the Indian Ocean to Lake Victoria. But in this particular part, not only is that the, the slight bend because of Kilimanjaro, but there's also the, the, the border where Taveta is situated. This actually follows much more closely natural boundaries. Essentially, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a higher altitude and then goes down. Um, so there's an interesting colonial history of border negotiation between, between British and German colonial um, authorities at the time. Um, so, so in a sense, Taveta sits in, in a little Kenyan, you know, Bulge, bulge, if you like, into Tanzanian territory. Um, and you can see that more closely on the map on the, on the um, bottom left. Um, the other thing which is interesting, you can see there's two lakes and, and the two, two bottom um, uh, maps is Lake Chala, which is volcanic, cold and deep, and then Lake Jeep in the south, um, which is sh shallow and it's, it has lots of fish and much more economically <coughs> important, I guess. Um, both lakes are, divide, lakes are divided between Kenya and Tanzania. And you can also maybe just about see, maybe if you look at the middle map at the bottom, um, where, where Taveta is highlighted, um, there is a bypass road. So the road, the, the cross-border road between Kenya and Tanzania um, now runs past the actual town. So Taveta itself um, doesn't have the big cross-border traffic. Um, and if you stay in the bottom middle map, um, you can see that this little cross, which is the, the um, Anglican uh, church in Timbila, that's where, where we are based if we are in the area. So the, you know, the logistics has worked out um, like that, that, that. That's where our main, uh, main consultant sessions are. Um, and that's maybe it's, the, you know, it's just under an hour walk, I think, to, to the main, main town center. Um, and then if you go to the, um, the language map, the SRL map on the top, um, on the bottom right, um, you can see a that that it's so Saveta is the little green dot there at the bottom, and there's lots of white next. It. That's because that's it's um, it's the national park. It's Tsavo, uh, Tsavo West and East around there. Um, so this is Tsavo, Tsavo West, which essentially means that the community is almost a little bit like Tanzanian looking because the closest town I think it probably shows on the I have lots of maps on the next map, um, or even you can see on the top right hand um, map that Moshi is probably the first bigger place to get to because on the right hand side going back and on the east hand side going back into Kenya, Kenya, there is lots of lots of national park uh, without any um, any urbanity around. Um, and the other thing which is worth saying that there's overall there is a sense of that the area belongs to the coast. There's a real Swahili coastal atmosphere, if you like, um, as well um, in 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 the area. Um, this is now so here we can see the, um, the, the land formation. And maybe the only interesting thing is if you look at the bottom map on the right hand side, there you can see quite neatly the, the shading between high altitude and, and green and more lushness. Um, and there really the border seems to follow quite closely the geographic features, which is otherwise in, you know, in, in this particular border um, unusual. Um, so this is, this is where we are situated geographically. Um, and of course, I said that there's, there's strong links to Tanzania also, also in terms of, of languages um, and language affiliations. Um, so in, in specifically with respect to the beta, there has been for several years community members uh, being engaged in promoting and supporting the language. 
and culture through there's grassroots publishing, the education events, there's weekend schools, um, there's um, um, cultural events, um, activism type things, Bible translation. Um, and on the right hand side, we see one of our um, um, our project team, Nashia Kodawa. Um, he has been working quite actively on on developing um, Tabeta language material, mainly learning material, but also also poetry, songs, cultural things. Um, so so this is important because it's really useful for this particular documentation project. Um, we started in 2019, and that was on the basis of contact which had been made by one of our PhD students, um, Francisca McNeil, who went in must have been 2015, and met with our now, uh, now collaborator, Jimmy Kehara. And Jimmy said, look, we are having this language activism and we would like to collaborate with linguists more widely. Um, and then, then Francisca got us in touch because she was working on the Tanzanian side. Um, we started communicating and then at some stage we set up a project. So that then uh, was in, normally in 2019 um, with funding from the British Academy, not a lot, but for you know, for fieldwork field work funding, it was fine. Um, so we have Clara Momani, who is herself a, a well-known Swahili scholar um, who comes from the community. Um, Jimmy Kara, he is a public health person who doesn't come from language, he comes from sciences, uh, but again, a community member. Um, and then I first had initial discussion and then Hannah, who has a project on Swahili variation actually in the area, um, then got involved in this as well. Um, and though, even though we were ready in principle to roll it all out in 2020, that didn't happen because of COVID. Um, so we had two intensive project workshops of you know, um, visits um, in 2022. So that's that's really when we started. Um, here's a little bit of my imagery on the left, top left. Um, that's the, the entrance or exit, if you like, um, to town. On the right hand side, that's Timbila. So that's where we are based. It's a, you know, a little suburb, if you like. Um, on the bottom left hand side, this is this is close to Lake Jeepa, so that gives a sense of the countryside. You can see um, there's elephants wandering about in, in the background, um, and that's because the national park is, is so close. And then on the right hand side, that's Lake Jeepa as well. Just an impression. There, so there is there is maritime life, there's boating, there's fishing. Um, so that's that's quite important. It's interesting that's that traditionally in brackets, um, that, that fishing is not done by Tabeta folk, but, but it's Luo speakers migrating into the area more recently um, on to, to, to um, fishing. To it. People eat fish, but, but in, you know, not industrial. The commercial fishing, I guess, um, is, is seen as a, as a Luo activity. Um, this is um, our project. So on the top left-hand side, this is Clara Romani and me. We are both squeezed for some reason. Um, in, in Nairobi, when we started in our first couple of meetings, when we uh, thought that through, um, and then the top two um, pictures on the middle and the right. Um, this is the radio station. So I said there's community activity, um, and that's one one of the big projects they have in mind is to have a community radio station, and that's progressing. So this is the the um, um, the um, community radio mast which we see here, um, and in the bottom left hand side, that's the that's the office premises, which as you can see, is a little bit empty. So there's an, there's a there's a fundraising activity. Um, trying to get um, sponsorship donors involved, other other financial um, um, support uh, for setting up a community community station specifically for broadcasting in Tarveta. Um, and then on the the bottom right hand side, the two pictures. This is now do, during our visits on the left hand side. Um, that's a that's a bunch of people. You can see um, Hannah sort of in the middle of the picture. Um, and then uh, you know I have I have better images I think later on. Um, but you can see that is sort of the, the setup in which most of the work takes place. And on the right hand side, we had um, the, you know, there is quite a bit of um, cultural interest, linguistic interest. I said there's activism. This is a, um, a, a dance group maintaining and indeed developing um, Taveta lyrics, Taveta music, Taveta dance. And there's, there's certainly discourse about closeness to Maasai in terms of musical expression, in terms of dress code. Um, less so maybe in terms of language, but that's that's an interesting question, which which is part of our um, our project. Um, and so we had, we had you know both the performance, but then maybe more interesting, uh, quite a long discussion with participants in in the group about their their approach to language and culture. And you can see here actually, so there's there's in the front or there's uh, some wazé, so these are um, you know mature gentlemen. Uh, but actually, if you look further back, there's quite a bit of young people as well. So that's why I said earlier. You know that there's a perception 
um, of, of lack of, of um, intergenerational transmission. And I think there's some truth to it, but there is also, also interest amongst young people to engage with culture and language. So, mm -hmm. so that's another interesting um, aspect of the dynamics of the situation. Um, and then I think, I think finally, in terms of images, so this is the, the project team. Um, so this is another angle on the top left. Um, I put that mainly because on the very left hand side, the lady in green, that's Clara Momanyi, who came down from, from Nairobi um, on that, that occasion. So she is one of the project leader, the leaders. Um, and then you can see Hannah in the top left hand side corner as the second from, from the right on top sitting there. Um, at the bottom, <clears throat> that's uh, it's on the, in the uh, up uh, the, to the right standing, that's Tom, our PhD student, and sitting on the right, that's Jimmy Kihara, the other Kenyan um, Kohai. And on the bottom right in the image, that's the, our four Waze, um, who are the main main project consultants, really, and indeed main language activists. Um, interesting that they, they all have education backgrounds, so not all of them, three of them are retired teachers. Um, and one of them is, is um, a, lay, a lay priest who has, has a church back on. So you can see there's, uh, you know, there's also there's you know, three males, one females. So there's a, there's a particular demographics in, in, in terms of our engagement with the language, which is important as well. Ah, good. And the final thing in terms of project background, we run a little fundraising project. I, I'm conscious that some members of the audience actually contributed very generously, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, and that was in part in part because we had our our uh, the, the SOAS fundraising infrastructure architecture was running out, so we had to run it quite shortly. But we ran it, I think, for two months, and we did raise three hundred and fifty pounds, which is which is still sitting here, but which will go to um, printing costs for these teaching materials, which I just showed one example, uh, which which the the community is engaged in. Um, which is interesting because there has a recent there's a recent policy change in Kenya about education and language and education, where many more community languages have a legitimate place in at least primary education. So there is a real opportunity for you know, communities like the Tabeta community to bring their language into mainstream education. It has already a place in sort of um, informal education, but bring it into formal mainstream education. Um, and then of course the the provision of material is a key element in there as well. So we're very pleased and very grateful indeed. Uh, for, for the contribution here. Um, and I was also keen to said that earlier, our funding has run out. So I was interested in how we can use alternative sources to support maybe also the community radio station, which I think, you know, you know I, I think realistically research funding, academic funding, at least from the UK, would be very stretched to, to do that. So that would be different funding streams, maybe charity funding, maybe, you know, bigger fundraising projects. So I was, I was keen to explore that a little bit as well. Um, good. Let me briefly talk a little bit about the language um, ideologies and attitudes, slightly mindful of the time. <laughs> um, so Kita Veta is in a closely linked to the Veta society and culture that, you know, maybe as you would expect, but, but you know, yeah. Anyway, um, so the language is, is valued at least by, by, by the activists we work with. And there's language and cultural activism, there's Bible translations, I said that, and literacy, the development of an orthography, and there's extracurricular teaching, and now the move into bringing that into the mainstream educational system. Um, there's a sense of language endangerment and lack of intergeneration transmission of the language. Um, there's a conceptual contrast of, of Taveta as opposed to, in contrast to, a neighboring Taita. So the province is called Taita Taveta, and the Taita a bigger community. And I think the Taveta community sometimes seems to seems to think that that you know they are slightly not not visible as as they should be in that in 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 juxtaposing the two names. Um, but also in contrast to the national language Swahili. Um, and I have a little excerpt from a poem by one, one of our, our um, consultants, Kodawa, um, who has a, a, you know, he's, he's a very prolific poet. And one of his poems is about, about the promotion of, of Kitaveta. So he writes that, um, let's free ourselves from slavery of loving other languages too much. Uh, today, I want, uh, I want us to provoke ourselves knowingly that the truth shall surely be said because from sunrise to sunset, we keep on communicating in the Swahili. Um, and then the refrain is that the Kitubeta language should be promoted both inside and outside Taveta. So, so you can see that there's a dynamics of you know, almost competition, I should, I should think, between Swahili, which is taken over as national language, um, and, and the promotion and preservation from, from Taveta, which I, I think in many contexts, certainly in East Africa, that's the case. And then the, you know, I think the perceived answer at the moment is to address that through bilingual, multilingual models of education and communication. Uh, but I thought it was very interesting that this is, you know, this is quite clearly articulated, if you like, 
um, artistically in this in this in this poem. Um, I, I speak a little bit also about some early results and topics which we which we worked on. Um, having I mean having said that, it, you know, the, the, we had two visits of about two weeks each, which was really successful, and we were very well set up. Partly because we had the strong links with the Kenyan collaborators before starting, uh, but I found it really hard to spend much time on it whilst being in London, just because then life takes over, which is something actually it would be nice to come back to when we um, come to the question time. But I can talk a little bit about the lexical structures we have. So this is just what it looks like. It's a spreadsheet at the moment for various reasons. Um, that's what we decided to do, uh, where we work with different word lists. So that you know, there's SIL word lists, which I'm sure you're aware of this. Um, um, there's a particular Bantu word list which was done in, at the University of Dar es Salaam you know, a good 20 years ago, I think. Um, so we use different different standard word lists, um, and then and then you know either either through conversations, through you know sessions, we talk about things, but also by just asking asking the committee to go through word lists and translate, and then to de develop a um, a Taveta a Taveta database to start with. Um, and that's in part also because there is interest from the community to have a dictionary. It's still, that seems to be you know one one of the tangible outputs of the project, which we're nowhere near of achieving. But that's that's certainly on the agenda, and this is the first starting point. Uh, but also, also it's interesting for all kinds of other 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 questions, including uh, questions of lexical fields and lexical lexical semantics. So, one of the things we briefly looked at, partly partly triggered by. Um, by by an invitation I had to to um, um, in Düsseldorf to give a class on um, a, a expression of emotion African languages it wasn't it was mainly mainly Swahili actually but I talked a little bit about the Kita Veta as well um, so then what we what we put together um, is this different nouns maybe expressing may, mainly expressing emotion so if um, Louis Shiro for happiness um, which you know which, which you know, is derived from a, from a verb to be happy. Um, we have uh, to be sad, be angry. We have jealousy. That was interesting. Lexical contrast: that jealousy in relation to property, um, as opposed to jealousy in 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 relation to humans, to a human relationship. Um, pride, desire, loneliness, and that, you know, there's a little example of of a possessive construction: um, to be tired, exhausted, and to love. Um, what what you know what we wanted to show with that is just the the you know the complexity, if you like, of formal expression in that area. So we have. Um, nouns in different noun classes. We have verb to noun derivation. We have, you know, we have this sometimes quite, quite, um, quite neat semantic distinctions uh, with different emotions. Um, I think I've summarized that here. So um, it stores on both lexical and morphological resources. So different lexical roots with the fine grit distinctions. The, you know, I said that the jealousy, jealousy with relationship as opposed to property, or you know, along animate lines, if you like. Um, we have different noun classes, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven are all all represented, and then we have derivation from 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 verbs to nouns with both noun class integration, but also then derivation suffixes. Um, again, this is just it's just it's just a small list of words, but it's an interesting area to develop, uh, which we haven't done. So as I said, this is in a sense this is the state where we are, and then the question is where we where we go from here. Um, the other element we looked at, and this is maybe more, if you like, anthropological, um, it's the stages of, of um, the female, sorry, it's the expression of gender in the lexicon. So in one, one set of terms, and this is partly by association in, in, in consultant session, just discussions about, about different aspects of lexical structure. Um, so we came up with a much longer list of, of stages in, in female marital status, that is in, in women's you know, development. Um, traditional development stages than males. So what they have here, that's the that's the female one. So there's there's lexicalized difference between a stage of not, not yet initiated, then um, a participant in a female initiation ceremony, um, an initiated girl but still teenage. And you can see there's also of course meta commentary on on usage, which is interesting. This is you know, just just based on people's intuitions, but it also shows that there's a dynamics in usage and probably interpretation of these terms. Um, then we have um, a, a grown woman, a newly married woman, um, who is not supposed to leave the house. So there's you know there's quite a bit of uh, of behavior as well associated with behavior up to marriage, with marriage marriage ceremonies, um, and afterwards we went to one. 
ceremony where the, the bride married a groom from, um, from Uganda. Um, and that, of course, the long distance relationship mean, meant that, that the usual ceremonies maybe couldn't quite done in the way they would normally be done. So they, they had like, it was a far, uh, far or event, probably longer, but they had to fast forward one where essentially they said, so this is now the stage where, you know, where it was an initiation stage. And then let's pretend we're forwarding six months. And now we are six months later. And this is now before the marriage. Let's forward another six months. So there was a fast, fast tracking of all these stages, which was done very neatly. Um, but so that, you know, there's, you know, that it's certainly still there, but it's also certainly adapted to, to you know, different conditions which obtain at the moment. So anyway, so newly married women, it's you know, having, you know, being supposed not leaving the house. And then some, you know, after that period, comes then the newly married women and then in marriage and then there's there's the stage of having experienced you know, marriage for for a longer time so what i'm where i'm going with that is there's there's you know fairly distinct lexical distinctions on these different stages of you know of relationship or of you know coming coming of age um whereas if you compare that to the male marital status and again i'm not ent entirely sure you know, not not convinced that that's that's exhaustive but this is what what you know i think in what, what you know what our consultants could think of in current current usage or what their forms they were aware of um, and that's of course much less so these are three terms uh, which have essentially you know um, not initiated initiated and married um, so you can see there's a, there's an you know imbalance if you like between gender um, and this one we've just thrown that in that that's you know quite common you know across many languages certainly many Bantu languages um, in terms of the the active passive relation with with marriage, uh, where the male male marrying the female is to marry, but the female is getting married by the by the male. Um, and that's just <clears throat> a comparative example with teacher, which works on a similar with the passive. So the the person teaching is the teacher, the the student is the one being being taught. So this is quite productive to use the different you know different agency in processes with with passive morphology. Um, so what is interesting about that, maybe that lexical structure then relates to female and male and female life stages uh, and, to, <clears throat> and to marriage and stages in marriage that shows an imbalance between male and female. And that the um, differentiation is higher in terms of the stage of or women is higher than those of men. Um, and presumably the more, you know, the more stage in the, in the tradition, reflect the tradition, more, you know, the more stage in the traditional scare, scare quotes, education of females in the path to adults than, than for males. And so in general, that the lexical differences here um, uh, between men and women relate to relationships, um, reflecting the different established roles played by both genders in the process and concept of gendered educations and, and relationships. So that's another, you know, interesting way coming from the language side um, um, to, to say something about, in this case, social structure. Um, and the final, um, final example I have here um, is loan words and loan translations. Um, so that was a really interesting discussion over the over the course of the project. Um, that in many cases we had like there was you know we had two forms for the same referent, um, and that was often accompanied also with quite a bit of discussion and meta awareness of of these relevant forms. So the example I have here is uh, coffee is better than tea. So kahawa, in in both you know both one and two is, is kahawa the word for coffee. From Swahili, but uh, the, what I'm after is the tea. So kahawa ni yedi kukela chai in the first example, and then kahawa ni yedi kukela molulu in the second example. Um, so this is now the question: To what extent chai is the Tabeta word for for tea, or molulu, and how how that dynamic between these these two forms works out? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Another example for gift. Um, so this is the grandmothers are giving the children gifts, and the word for gift we have. And the first example is Zawadi, which is a loan word from Swahili. Then the second one is Biingwa. Um, and that is, you know, it's it's maybe a, a neologism, it's it's a formation um, from, from Kingwa. But then again, so you can see I've put I've put the date here so that it goes, you know, the discussion went from April to August, uh, which were, which is when we were there. Um, that there was a sense that Biingwa is is related to Kingwa, and that is really more like. Know, talent it's in god's gift so there is an element of gift but it's really different kind of gift so then being where really ought to be talent and then in august there was a different term which came up which is toner where people felt that is really the right you know right right um, word for gift 
But what is interesting here is this is this dynamics meta discussion about lexical replacement and and the status of loanwords loanwords from Swahili. Um, this one is next another example picture from Swahili from English picture. Um, but then the the um, Taveta but Fuana um, a similar discussion around that. This one was slightly different. That's bicycle. So it's bus bus Kelly. So it's, it's, a, it's the in the first example. There was a sense that that it ought to be spelled and pronounced Baskeli, um, which would be the Taveta version, if you like, of the of the Swahili Baiskeli, which is closer to the English bicycle. So there's a bit of more adaptation. But then there was also a discussion of whether maybe Msambo Sambo would be the better term, which which is a thing which rolls or is being pushed around. But there there was a feeling that this is really you know, almost like an invention here on the spot, whether that's really used in the community, I think people were not entirely sure about. So, so there's a real scale also in terms of what could be used for expressional concepts and to what extent is that widely spread in the community, which links back actually to, I want to come back later, to variation within, uh, within Taveta. Um, this is a slightly different different question of loan translations, and that you know, I'm, I'm, we haven't done any further thinking about that. But it is interesting. So the word for also in first naya, vula vula azoke jipe. Um, it's it's vula is the it's a distal demonstrative. It's reduplicated, and that of course is very you know very tran you know transparently similar to vile vile in Swahili, which you could use in that context as well. So then the question becomes. Is that just you know accidentally parallel, or is there a language contact element that people essentially take the Swahili structure um, and then and then pattern translated that into the into the Taveta structure, or the other way around? Of course, that's a possibility as well. Although, the, given the language dynamics, it's probably more likely from Swahili onto onto into Taveta. Um, and similarly, in the second example, this is the teacher who traveled to Mombasa together with that's what we're after the students. So. Um, um, and is, is um, a locative heart prefix plus mwe, the word for one, which is structurally equivalent to pamodya in, in Swahili, which would be then the translation as of together here as well. So whether together is a useful form to be formed in that way anywhere independently or whether there's influence from Swahili, it's an interesting, interesting question to ask. Um, and the other structural influence we noted here is the is the you know the preference for having an, a class one object marker with with animate objects, which is a you know hallmark Swahili you know, a standard Swahili structure at least. Um, so this is Nasida uh, Nimweza kum kela naya. So Nasida is taller than naya. One or two say exactly the same thing, but two people were hesitant precisely because it didn't have the class one object marking. Whether whether that's Swahili influence or whether whether the language moves towards um, more animate based agreement, it's you know, again it's an interesting question to ask where we don't have an answer. Um, good. So in, to to summarize that sort of loanword type type um, set of data due to the language situation and the strong presence of Swahili in the Taveta area, language contact is widespread and there are many instances of Swahili loan, loanwords in Taveta. Uh, while some loans are well established, like Kahaba, for example, that that was you know. Never, there wasn't really an alternative for that. Um, others are subject to dynamic process of integration into the language. In some cases, the lexical doublets. So, in a Taveta word and a Swahili don't with the same meaning. Um, and then, interesting, the dynamics around that is that you know language activists or you know uh, you know our group of consultants would then often promote or at least think about the use of the perceived historic Taveta word, um, which reminded me a little bit. So, there's work by Tony Woodbury, what he calls the ancestral code. Um, and work uh, work which I did with uh, Marlene Pitzel some times back. And I have just two slides here, and I hope that's not too confusing, um, on Kagule, which is a different language that's now across the border in Tanzania, but it's just because it reminded me so much of that. So this is the work I did with Marlene, um, and this is a, a Kagulu story where we have um, the color coding mean, the yellow one is the edited version. So this is what, what was published eventually in the, in the Nejad Languages Archive. But the original recording has the has the green and indeed the red. So the green and the and the yellow are identical. But what is interesting is that the reds are 
loan words from Swahili in Kagulu, which were part of the original story, which then in the further process of reflection, working with the text, got replaced by, by more authentic um, Kagulu words. So what we have, when what Mal and I concluded is that we have sort of a, a speaker editor manipulation of non-Kagulu forms and, and that they are replaced by perceived deep Kagulu. Um, across all kinds of, um, of lexical forms. So we have nouns, verbs, adverbs, pronouns. Um, there's the addition of traditional open and closing formulas. And one form we were particularly interested in was um, halafu, which in, in the story is a really important, important form. It's, I think 10% of all words in all stories halafu, meaning then, and then, which makes sense in the genre. Um, but they were all replaced by, by the corresponding Kagulu from Kamai, which of course has a huge effect on, in, in effect on, the, on, the, on, the, on the tokens in the text um, overall. And then, so that is the link to Woodbury stuff. It's the establishment of supposedly more traditional conservative variety, thereby creating or potentially creating a more homogenous and more, you know, if you like, essentialized version of the language. So the, the, I think the Woodbury work really is interesting in that area. And there may well have been Later, later discussions of that as well. Um, good, but that now come. Let's come back to Daveta. Sorry, the, we have a number of plant outputs. Just again to go back to where we are with the project. So, um, so what I just talked about. This is something <clears throat> we want to write up as you know, aspects of lexical semantics and loanword adaptation in Greater Beta. Um, so indeed, you know, any any discussion of that would be useful because we are just about um, getting that that out. Um, we also have you know, have plans to write something about community language and literacy practices in Taveta. Um, so that goes back to the to the work on building language material, language primers. Um, it links to the fundraising project we have. What is the, what is the industry around that? But what, what are the modes of production? What is the intellectual um, effort in it? How do you how do you decide on which forms enter that that discourse? Um, so that's something we want to do all, all against the background that we've run out of funding. So this is in part A, to, to get some outputs going, but also to continue engaging with the community. We have a very good network. So we speak on, on WhatsApp. So that's going really, really well. Um, but but to, to have some you know, intellectual progress, I think would be really good to keep the project going. Um, and the, the third um, you know, output paper we're playing around with um, is again about teaching, but that's in particular in the context of of the of the development now of in, introducing community languages into standard education in Kenya, and how that plays out in the context of of Taveta. Um, so it's similar, but it's a little bit different to the um, to the um, specific output um, I mentioned before. Um, and then in particular, I bolded it here how variation provides a challenge for documentation and development of language language materials. Um, Good. Um, then I briefly want to look at challenges and further works, and these are just you know, bullet points where we are. Um, I think linking to what I just said about the variation, um, I think that that was a really interesting discussion. Not you know, partly with the loan words of Swahili, but also partly to what extent are, are you know are forms widespread used? To what extent is the variation? Um, Pare is the is, is the close language, and that's mainly spoken across the board in Tanzania, but not exclusively. There are Pare speakers also on the Kenyan side. Um, and I think that you know there you know there is you know I, I think most people would think that you know there there are there are variations of the same language however you define that so there seems to be high levels of mutual mutual intelligibility there seems to be a sense of thinking of them of, of linguistic identity even though the, the varieties are differently named um, so that would be really interesting there was lots of you know lots of phone calls to people from other areas can you say that can you say that how do you say that. So there's, there's certainly awareness in the community and discussion about that. So it would be really nice to capture that as well um, as in, in, a, in a critical narrative, maybe about standardization. Um, and then, so the, the second point that we discussed just now, that's the loan words and the preservation of Kita Veta words or the, the reinvention, if you like, of Kita Veta words um, and what, what the dynamics around that is. Um, and that then links to the wider linguistic diversity multilingualism in the regional linguistic ecology. So one thing I think would be really nice um, is to develop the project in, in the wider context of other languages in the area. Um, but it, it's also interesting that, that in terms of, in from the perspective of the language activists we are working with, their main interest is, is on Kita Veta itself. So, so we had a little bit of discussion about follow on projects. Um, also in the context, there's plans to have a, a cultural museum space in addition to the radio station to have like, you know, yeah, I, th I think a museum is the right, a community center museum 
uh, place and there's actually there's a plot there's land for it but no no structures yet um but we had a lot of discussion about whether that should be a you know a space for languages and cultures of of Taita Taveta or even just the Taveta area so to what extent would that reflect languages other than Taveta which are quite established for some of them or whether it's specific to Taveta so is it more like a linguistic ethnic focus or a regional one and it was a really interesting discussion we had that in terms of you know multicultural multilingualism um and and giving voice to particular communities um I, you know I think both research wise and and in terms of you know more more applied usages I think that's a really interesting space to go into um and that then links me to the final point is the logistics and follow-on projects um so so I think the logistics are good we are in communication but it would be really nice to to develop it a little bit further and for me it might I mean I'm hey, hey, I'm looking forward to a sabbatical next year so my life will be much better but at the moment the way my life goes it's really hard to keep it going in London any meaning in any meaningful way to to work on the on the data so so in that case also a project would be useful um good so with that I'm I think I'm I'm done oh perfect um so I think where we are we, we, we I think we made a promising start of the documentation project mainly because it's built on the established community activism. So I think, I think you know, working with people from the community in the way we've done has really helped us to set up the project. And, you know, it has, has, of course, its own dynamics and you know, limitations, maybe, if you like. But in terms, of, in terms of getting the project on the ground, in terms of you know, the, the, the agency, the ownership, I, th I thought that was really, really nice. Um, I think we have a strong team and good working practices. I think you know people like each other. I think we know what we're doing. I think there's a, a sense of purpose which we which we share. Um, we have early results relating to lexical structures, some social linguistic aspects, community literacy, the you know language education. That's some areas which we started started developing. Of course, partly our interest was more for syntactic, but there hasn't much happened yet. Um, we have initial dissemination plans. So I think that's important to get outputs out there, even if they're not you know, finished products. Um, but then, as I said, the current project funding has ended, and it's one of the things which we're thinking about how to best then translate it into something else. Um, and with that, yeah, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to have a little discussion. Thank you very much for the presentation. Yeah, we can go straight into the question and answer section. So if you want to ask a question, you can either write it in the chat, and I will read it out for the recording, or you can raise your hand, and I'll give you a turn to unmute. Uh, please remember that the webinars are being recorded, so any question you ask will be a part of the recording. And I see Martin has raised his hand. Uh, Martin, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Lutz. Uh, lovely to uh, hear you and to hear about uh, Tuveta. Um, I have two questions. The, uh, the, um, the emotion terms, uh, so how did you collect them? Is, do you, is there... Is that is the danger of a bias from a Western bias in what kind of terms uh, were collected? There was no pride in there, which really surprised me. Uh, and then uh, the other question is about uh, Pare. I mean, how do the Taveta feel about, well, uh, sharing practices with Pare or, or using the the materials that are there for pare and maybe adapting them is the yeah are, are they willing to the, for that or are they really eager to to be different uh, uh very good thank you i think uh, both really good questions i think with the emotions it's so it wasn't it wasn't a, a dedicated you know sub project so mm. that, that arose out of you know essentially you know, word lists i think that's the starting point so that word is so the the Dar es Salaam one is a, is a Swahili word. So so essentially we had English Swahili word lists, and you know some only English, some only Swahili, but most of it both. And then and then a lot of our work was also conducted in these two languages. Um, and then I think it was you know it was just we we had a bunch of of you know emotion terms, and then then you know and anyone really I or somebody else would follow. Oh, that's really interesting. You know, for example, you know, we, we had we had a, a, a word for for you know, a, a, a verb for love. Could could that become a noun? And then people go, oh yes, you know, yeah, that's that's how you do it. Um, or you know, the the jealousy. We spent a lot of time talking about that. What exactly the differences are? And then you go back to English or Swahili, but then you find it's you can't. It doesn't work in English either. 
and then it becomes a sort of meta commentary maybe so that's why we ended up it's a, it's an animacy thing which which now i realize actually i think it's it's typologically not uncommon i think czech has the same thing so it's not like wildly uncommon but i think we we arrived that through you know you, you talk on wednesday you come back on on thursday maybe friday morning i would say you know i'm still not quite sure about this um, so it was a, a sort of slightly unsystematic discursive way of reaching there, which meant that that crucially it's not, it's not exhaustive. You know, none none of these fields are. So the, the pride is a really interesting question. It would be easy to have missed that um, because then so we would ask people, oh, you know, can you brainstorm of, of you know emotion terms? But you know that you know it may you know you get something, but of course it's not exhaustive either. So. I think I think that's true for all our work. Actually, that's that's why I'm quite keen always to say initial, because mm -hmm. these are little avenues we explore without really systematically following following up. But um, but I I think you know it would be nice not to go back to much say typological work on the lexical fields of of emotions, and go back there as well. I think in terms of bias, I don't think there's a particular English bias, just because the whole situation is a little bit more multilingual that, that, than that. But there might be an English so Swahili bias. Um, but but I think a lot is also free association. And you know, it's nice working with the team. There's lots of moments where these guys have a long conversation in Taveta about the finer nuances of a word, which, you know, I mean, I, I then have to ask at some stage, or you know, Hannah or Tom, or you know, so can you, you know, where where are we with this now? What what's happened here? And then people are happy to explain. So I think I think it takes that takes it then into sort of finer lexical discussions. Um, but certainly the exhaustiveness is, you know, that that's the real that that's just not there. Um, and with the part that's really interesting, I think I think part of what stands in the way is that there are different names and established names people know and and refer to. So I, I don't think I don't think we could just take you know a para prime and use that for the Taveta stream in primary school. I think people would find that odd. But I, on the other hand, I do think that people think that. Para and Taveta are really quite close. So, so when when you know when there is a question of dialect variation and people phone, phone friends like you know oh this person here next you know, they are next to Lake Jala and they are next to Lake Jipe and we know they speak a bit differently, they would easily also say and oh this person or oh, they speak Para let's check with them as well. So there is a sense of it's part of the same variety. I think what might be interesting I don't we haven't reached broached that at all. Um, to have like a, you know, a cross-border combined effort around it. I think the name will stand in the way, but apart from that, I think you know, it, it, I think it would be certainly interesting to see what, what materials do we have in Para, what do we have in Taveta, and then maybe just translate them, but the translation task will be much easier than translating you know, from Swahili or from English. So, so that might be a really interesting way to go. I think my impression is the, the you know, the, the, um, the way the way people situate themselves is is more in contrast maybe to Swahili and and Taita, just because that's is within Kenya. So that's also where the political context is. Hare is across the border in Tanzania, so that's a very different dynamics. But but I think there's also a sense that people think of Hare as part of the of a wider community sharing different things and including language. And so in terms of practical practical teaching material development and and other elements, I think that would be very interesting. Right. Um, I, I've just shared a study on this side. Uh, there was a, a collaboration with an, a native speaker of Kwekwe and some social psychologists on emotion terms that you might not come across. So I thought oh, they had some thank you. interesting categories there. Well, my my uh, comment question is on the loanword adaptation, and I'm really interested to see that paper when it comes out. And I guess two things that I would be most curious about are one, do you think the specialization of the native word changes over time. That, that is to say, at the beginning, the two might be equal, the Swahili term and the old word, and does that sort of narrowing and meaning, do, does that take time? That's one question. And then the second is, do you think the semantic changes, and I guess I'm mainly interested in the native vocabulary, <laughs> that these are different semantic, or not different semantic changes, but say a, they might have more narrowing than say metaphor metonymy sort of changes. You know, when you, you look at the sort of <laughs> what types of semantic changes occur, do you see an over reliance on a particular type? And and it would just be interesting to say, can we detect loan words or, 
you know, by the sort of semantic changes that, that loan words are native words by the some types of semantic changes that tend to occur. That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's a very big question. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's 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 hard to answer because because we don't really have a lot of time depth in terms of description. Um, so it's it's difficult to trace trace changes. Um, and the other thing which is really interesting, I don't think we have a good handle on at the moment, is to what extent these terms are widespread in the community. So I think I think there's some where we have, you know, where there's a Swahili word, but there's an established Taveta word as well, which are which are used maybe interchangeably with, with slight semantic nuances. But I think there's also other cases where where there is a Swahili loan word and then a sort of you know, Taveta neologism, which which maybe got invented in the in the course of the Bible translation, that really plays a big, big role. These are language activists in terms of, you know, in terms of verbal art. So, you know, people who write Taveta poetry, they will then say, which word can I use? And then it's I think it's a fine line between which word can I use, which I know people are using, which I heard. Or which word can I use, which I haven't anybody actually heard using it, but I invented hereby, and it now you know it's it's transparent enough that it conveys my meaning, and it's thereby a Taveta word, and whether it's accepted in the community or not, I don't know. But so the people we work with, they are all really quite on the forefront of that activism. They 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 publish, they write in Taveta, they have they do the poetry, they work with young people, so they have this theater groups or, or music and dance groups where. In part, it's old old Taveta songs and poetry, but they are often difficult because they're often quite quite contextual. So it involves knowing who the song is about. Um, so there's a little bit of naming and shaming. There's a little bit of you know giving kudos to someone. So there's a social control element. But but you know if that text is like 50, 60, 100 years old, then of course only very old people will know who who it refers to. And get get the point of it, namely, you know, telling somebody not 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 steal the you know not steal the neighbor's grain or something. Um, and either there's a traditional around that explaining what it means, or or it just becomes lost. But then, so the, so so, but it's interesting. Then for younger speakers, the question becomes: Do we maintain the genre and do we keep that poetry, but using developing new 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 songs, new poems? And at that point, we come again to the question of what is a Taveta word and what isn't. So, and I, you know, I don't know enough about what would be really interesting to a look at text and then and then talk to to creative creative people who produce these texts. What is their strategy or you know their behavior or the, the policy almost um, to to using vocabulary and and you know what what resources do you draw on? And I think I think that would allow us to answer the question you're asking, which I think is really interesting. What is then the semantic trajectory of that, you know, what, what, you know, is do you do you make use of of having different lexical resources by then having slightly different semantics for them, um, and and are there are there patterns we, which we can identify in terms in terms of the of the you know of the development? But I mean, I just said we don't have documentation. It's not to I mean I mean the the poetry is it's not documented well or written. I don't think there's a little bit. Um, but it's certainly still around, and people people perform it, um, and we have recordings, so we could, you know, given time, we could actually transcribe it, um, and then go back. And we had, um, so we had long discussions with the performers and and our group about the relevance of this stuff for today, um, which a lot of it's in Taveta. So uh, you know, for me, it's not easy accessible either, but it's 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 there. We could, you know, time and money permitting, we could transcribe that and raise that again, and from from there. Ask those sort of questions. What what is the semantic change? What is the role of of loan words? What is you know other loan words other than Swahili as well? Is there meta discourse on that as well? And and what is what is the semantic developments? Are people aware of that? Well, I'd like to ask a follow up question since no one else has their hand up yet. Lutz, do you? It, it sounds like the answer is probably no. But have you seen any tendency towards these neologisms either trying to hint at the Swahili form or in the op in the converse trying to be di quite distinct and different from the Swahili phonologically speaking ah I, if at all I would think different I, th I think okay. I think the so so the example with the, I think it was the chai with this molulu I mean that that's that's you know a, a, a derived form but it's also I mean 
I don't, I'm not sure if it's intentional, but it certainly sounds very different. And I think, I mean, that's, you know, my, my feeling is that, that there is a sense of the, the reason for that is partly to maintain, you know, to maintain as much vocabulary as possible because it is an element of documentation and preservation. But I think it's also, it's also, you know, you know, a, a, you know a lang almost like a language planning agenda um, in, in, you know, expanding and developing. And to some extent, given the, the language ideologies, I think to some extent to expand and develop in, in contrast as an alternative to Swahili. And in that case, then, you know, other things being equal, it would make sense to have terms which are also visibly and, and phonologically different. Um, it's, you know, it's, it, it's a question we could actually ask explicitly. It would be really nice to, to have a, you know, an informed discussion about that, what, what people's attitudes are. But it would also be nice to do a little corpus study if we had more examples like that and just see, you know, how, how, how in this case, Swahili words are replaced and, and what the, whether there is, there's, you know, specific correlations or non-correlations in terms of sound. Um, Andrew? Gosh, I think this would be a really nice next step if we're thinking about moving further with the documentation, looking at this oral poetic tradition. I think that there's so much there. I mean, working working with, with Gorwa oral literature and songs and poetry, like you said, I mean, you know, I think that if there's if there's an extant and sort of living practice there, I think that, yeah in terms of in terms of like figures of speech metaphor all of these things i think that you can really go like kwandani uh even more um the it's exciting to hear about all these sort of like living and very vital parts of the speaker community so hearing about this poetic tradition but also seeing this image of the broadcasting tower was incredibly exciting uh, to me personally. Um, and again, I've only worked in the Tanzanian context where something like this would be unconceivable, right? You wouldn't see a community broadcast tower, you know, specifically for uh, local language. Um, you talked a little bit, or you mentioned briefly about a, a a recent change in Kenyan government policy that would sort of facilitate bringing local languages, at least into the primary level education. Could you speak a little bit more on that? I I can I can try. I'm not I'm not the you know not 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 terribly, not, not terribly au fait with the details either. But um, I think I think I think where we are is that um, for for a language like like Taveta, if there was sufficient material, I think local primary schools could have, you know, I would imagine like a few hours a week. I don't think it would be like mainstream, but I think it would be possible to have education in the language in schools. It's very recent. So I, you know, I, I haven't followed it up. I haven't heard of any examples, um, but but so so essentially I, you know, I mean, actually if Hannah is still there, Hannah may, may well know more about it, but certainly it's also, it's it's, it's a ah, yes, she is even visible. Um, it's certainly it's a discussion topic within the community. So so there is awareness of that, and I think I think it, it leads up. You know, it, it, it's integrated into this wider agenda of language activism, which comes from the the Bible translations, the you know the song and dance, the poetry, um, and then that that's another element in that discussion. Um, but but yes, I I think that that's really encouraging. And you know, I was surprised with the with the with the radio station as well. It's a, it's uphill struggle because the funding around it, you know, it's you know you, as you can imagine. But I mean, to get a master, that's not you know, that's not that little either. So there is there's real real push around that. Um, and the other thing which is interesting is the question of intergeneration transmission. So so I think it's probably true. Most young people are more fluent in in Swahili or even English than in Taveta. In English, I'm not quite so sure. But well, you know, maybe maybe that as well. But I think there is also interest from some young people into Taveta, I find it hard to judge whether that's almost a little bit handpicked. So the people we work with, they run all these you know, after school intervention with schools. Um, so they would know that community quite well. I don't know if there is a, a, a huge cohort of young people and indeed non-young people out there 
who who are not at all engaged with Tibet and maybe you know, don't value it and or don't speak it, because given how we entered the community, our our context will be the ones who are all all very much interested in that. And I mean, these were two short visits. We, I mean, I mean, we, we never really had time to even spend like a night in town and just to observe. I mean, it was like you know you walk around a little bit and over here, but it's, it's very unsystematic and and very impressionistic what what we have, but. But to me, so when they first, the first impression I had that there's no young people speaking it ever, and that coming for the first time into the area, that seemed not quite right. Because, you know, as you can see from the images, there is certainly interest among some, and, you know, we had, we had poetry recitals from, you know, young speakers in their twenties or whatever, who were part of this whole, you know, activism group. Um, but, but that, you know, there are certainly some young people I think would take an, take an interest. Um, I'm not sure, Hannah, do you want to come in first or shall we have Helen first? I, you know. Maybe Helen, just to see what the next question is in the interest of time. Yeah, I'm sure, Helen. Thanks. Yeah, it's kind of a similar theme. I was just really encouraged by the positive, uh, the positivity, the activism. I'm wondering if you think this community is exceptional and if so, why? Is it these some specific individuals? Is there something about the context? Um, if it's working well, why do you think that is? Mm. I, I don't think it's that special, actually. I think it's a Kenyan Tanzanian thing, maybe. So so certainly I think I think, you know, um, like visiting friends in Kenya and you go to the house and say, Oh, hi, great food. And you speak Swahili, everybody in Tanzania would be you know, either it's normal or people would be happy. There is, you know, why do you speak Swahili? Why don't you speak Luo? And you're like, Excuse me. Okay, so so I think I think other languages other than Swahili have a higher status in Kenya than they maybe have in, in Tanzania. So and Lua, of course, is a big one. There's a whole I mean, Lua in particular, there's a whole political, you know, cultural discussion around that as well. Um, but but I think that plays all. I think you know we have there's a, a student who was at one of the um, language association of East Africa conferences. Um, she did her master's in Nairobi, but part of her agenda, if, you know, if, if, if time and money allows, was to work on Taita, so the next door language, with a similar idea. So she also felt that Taita is, is endangered or under threat from Swahili. There's a lot of, lot of push from bigger languages and not enough work being done. And my impression was that, that she wasn't like an isolated case. I think she was a perfect person placed like that with the background in linguistics, having studied it, coming from the community. But I, my, from talking to her, I felt that the community was quite interested behind her in that sense as well. Actually, I, I don't know whether that happened, that project, but but it seemed like, you know, it seemed quite similar. I think, you know, I think for the Tabeta case, A, it's just luck. So the right people have to be in place and it has to be the right time. So, so this is just nice that these people found together, you know, found each other and then found us. And, have the time and it, it was all just you know very fortuitous um that helps and i think you know i wonder whether there you know in this particular case it is you know there is this discussion about being in tighter tabeta province but feeling that people think of this more as tighter as tabeta so that you know tabeta there, there's you know you know I, I think a national understanding about tabeta it's, there's pop music and cultural music associated with that as well so i think there are specific individual cases but i also think the kenyan environment overall maybe is more, I, I don't know, conducive or encouraging, or maybe you know, or, or you know, pushes people more into into that sort of frame of mind. Um, I, I know, I know less maybe from from northern Kenya, but again, I mean, yeah, maybe Hannah, if if you have and and any others on this. The only other point I was going to make, I think, connects both Helen and Andrew's question, is that um, there's this discussion about competency-based curriculum in Kenya, mm -hmm. and the move towards that is very much linked to the move towards using a wider variety of languages, or at least making those materials available. So Ruth, who was one of the people we were working with here, has been involved in you know ongoing consultations about developing these materials. And, you know, as you will know from the Tanzanian context, that's very different, right? People aren't talking about how many different languages can we get, you know, early years education in. So I think that probably answers sort of both of those, those questions um, in terms of visibility. Um, and just to echo Lutz's point, on one hand, it's not that unusual. On the other hand, there are, you know, five really proactive, you know, really committed people who've been working on this for a long time and who do have the means and resources. Like they're, they were educators, you know, they're quite respected people in the community. So we all know that that also has an impact on, you know, this kind of work as well. So yeah, just to add that. 
Mm. And you know, and and they have the time as well. They are all, you know, they are young enough to be really active and you know outgoing. But they're you know they're they enough to having retired and you know enjoying their pension and you know not having like <laughs> so so it you know it's it's you know it's luck I think plays a role there as well. Um, but I mean, you know, yeah, it's a it's a very nice group to work with. I think that you know, it's also just it's just individuals almost. I think these guys like each other, and of course, if you spend like a week every day like on this tent thing, you can see also then the dynamics playing out. But also, you grow together as a sort of you know community of practice almost, and and that's just you know that I think that's just that's just good luck. You know, it may happen or may not happen. I just have a very short curiosity so particularly about the broadcast like what kind of content is now being conceptualized like would the poetic um, art forms translate well to that medium or is it more performative art or is it more like local news broadcast but then in the language for the radio station yeah um, i would i you know i'm not entirely sure how how far advanced the thinking is there i think i think at the moment it's very much fundraising to make it happen to start with um, and so you can see there's quite a bit of infrastructure there, but but the rooms are completely empty and you need at least like, you know, a mixing set and, you know, a microphone and, you know, these sort of technical things. Um, I think, I think, I think they probably envision actually all of that. So it, it, I think it would be a mix of, of useful things, news or, or you know, in, information spreading. So, so one of our collaborator, Jimmy Kihara, he comes from, um, from public health. So he's a medical science person. So, so for him, he could think immediately, of course, of usefulness in terms of you know, prevention of, the, of diseases, in terms of you know, even, even you know, support for farming or you know, better working practices around different aspects, you know, health and safety, you know, insurance questions, all, all kinds of practical things which, which can be communicated. Um, but I also think that there is this strong tradition of, you know, of poetry, of dance, of music, uh, which I think I you know I, I think they I think of it, but I, I think that constituents would be very vocal also if, you know, once it's up to say you know we want our airtime as well. Um, I you know I I I think you know you could easily think of sponsorship so you have like commercial you know advertisement if you like even in in the mix as well. Um, I you know I I I don't think I don't so they're they're fairly fairly specific plans and costed plans for the technical aspect of it. Um, I have, I, I'm not sure whether there's, there's much, much written down at least in terms of the content. Um, but it's a really interesting question to ask next time, next time we come as well. Um, Thank you, very interesting. Yeah, I look forward to hearing recordings that they go uh, yeah. online as well. Uh, no, watch, watch the space. I'm, you know, I, I hope, I hope we can make progress. I mean, that goes far, far to the funding. You see, our, uh, you know, research funding in the UK will not fund like a mixing desk or something. But, but I talked to, I mean, that's partly why, why this fundraising thing was good because I also talked to our fundraisers at SOAS and and outsiders. And of course, there's lots and lots of funding for like, you know, community engagement, charity, you know, young people, you know, gender equality. You know, who would not fund research. So you can't then go and say, I want to grammar activate it. They go, like, no, that's really weird. But who would be interested in, in funding a radio program? So to either have two funding streams or, or even combine that and say, look, this is the research context, or this is the context, there is a research element, but there's also really strong empowerment engagement element to it. And if you guys can fund empowerment engagement, maybe you can even fund, you know, not quite matched funding, but other funding sources for the research grant. And then you know, it's almost like a win-win situation where both parts enhance each other. Um, but so we had we started to look a little bit at, at you know funders outside of academia, and it's huge. I mean, <clears throat> there's so much out there. Not not about not in terms of money maybe, but in terms of funding opportunities, different agents, different agencies, <clears throat> with different priorities. Our research funding essentially it's like you know five six funders you go to. That's pretty much it. But for the charity funding, I think it's a much more complex landscape, and you have to know a little bit better who to ask for what. I think they all have their very specific agendas, rightly so, of course, of you know what they are engaged in, what they fund. So, so it's 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 there's quite a bit of research element to start with. What what are you asking for? What is your pitch, and who who do you ask it for? But uh, but I'm I'm quite hopeful actually that we find something. Or you know they I mean they're ahead of the game, <clears throat> but we are, we will be very happy to contribute as well. Thank you. I think those were all the questions and comments for today. Okay.
Looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 3rd of May, presented by Lizzie Poole, and the title will be announced later in the newsletter. Um, so yeah, let's thank you again for this really interesting presentation. Uh, everyone else, thank you for participating today and for the questions and comments. And I hope to see you again at our next webinar.